Okay, well, welcome everybody to this afternoon's mini webinar hosted by the School of Education. My name is Dr. Rachel Copeland, and I welcome you to our Leadership and Critical Needs Areas webinar today. Um, I'm Program Director of the MED Special Education Reading Specialist Program, in addition to the Postmaster Special Ed and Exceptional Education Executive Leadership Programs. Again, I thank you so much for joining us. Um, the purpose for the webinar is really just to discuss the positive impact that we can have as leaders in the field of special education and reading. Um, as we know, throughout the country, um, in addition to our state, these are really critical needs areas. And so the purpose of the webinar will just to have an open panel discussion to the guests that I've invited and really just discuss how administrators and instructional leaders, in addition to K-12 educators and higher ed programs, can really have um, a positive impact in the midst of these critical needs areas. And we know um, that while the need is great within these areas, we know that the impact that we can have can be greater. So I wanted to start by having our panelists just introduce themselves briefly. Um, Dr. Sonia Magai and Dr. Elizabeth Landry are two region adjuncts with the School of Education in these programs. And so Dr. Magai and Dr. Landry, go ahead, feel free to introduce yourselves. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. My name is Dr. Sonia Magai, and I am the internship coordinator for both special education and reading specialist programs here at Regent. I'm also an assistant professor. I have worked and am currently working in special education for Chesapeake Public Schools for 36 years and have um, experience in all areas of special education, including um, administration and student leadership and 504 coordinator for the school system. Thank you for inviting us today. And good afternoon. I am Dr. Elizabeth Landry. Uh, I currently serve as a administrative coordinator for language arts in Prince William County Public Schools. Um, I have 10 years experience in the classroom as a teacher grades K, K through four, and also as a literacy specialist uh, for elementary and middle schools. And I'm currently serving, uh, as I said, as a coordinator, but I have four years at the central office level. Um, in addition, I serve Regent um, as an adjunct professor teaching the reading specialist courses. So thank you. Thank you both for that introduction and your willingness to just provide your expertise as we discuss um, during this webinar today. So, all right, now the introductions have been complete, I wanted to just start by just providing some statistics outlined with the field of special education and with reading. Um, as we had said, these are such critical needs areas right now within our K-12 setting and throughout the country. And so um, just wanted to kind of start with a few statistics before we you know, really discuss further these particular areas. Um, Regarding special education, according to the Virginia Department of Education, um, special education has been identified as the top critical shortage area for the 22-23 academic year. And in addition to this, it is also a top shortage area within 47 other states in our country. Um, the VDOE also reported a 3.86 vacancy rate for teaching positions and 3,649 unfilled positions during the 23-24 school year. Um, in addition to that, a Higher Education Consortium for Special Education reported that the annual attrition rate for special educators is twice that of general education teachers. So again, all of these are emphasizing just the need um, within this particular area. In addition to teacher attrition, um, teacher retention continues to remain a concern within school divisions throughout the country. Um, when it comes to reading, um, the Virginia superintendent's memo put out in August 22 stated that across the Commonwealth, historically high numbers of K through two students are at risk for reading difficulties and 
far too many third graders are not passing the reading standards of learning SOL assessment. As of fall 21, one in three K through two students have been identified as at risk for reading difficulties. And relative to their peers, children from marginalized demographic groups have been identified as at risk for reading difficulties at high rates. Um, also, according to the Virginia Literacy Partnership Office, Virginia-wide, the rate for K-2 students identified at high risk for reading difficulties decreased from fall 21 to fall 22 and has not returned to the pre-pandemic levels. So these are just some of the statistics that we pulled today just to emphasize how much the need is and how much we can do to impact these particular fields. So I'm gonna go ahead and just open it up now um, with Dr. Landry and Dr. Madgy to just discuss. Um, I wanna begin with talking about leadership specifically um, with the administrators and instructional leaders. So um, give me your insight as far as how can administrator or instruction leaders within these areas um, really address the critical needs within special ed and reading? Thank you, Dr. Copeland, for the question. I really think that first and foremost, it's critical that administrators and leaders in buildings encourage their teachers to become an active part of crafting the initiatives that support special education and reading. And by making them a part of that, in that collaborative effort, it gives them buy-in, right? And I think that that is key, that they are made to feel that their expertise is needed in crafting initiatives to meet all the needs of the learners in their building. And uh, along those lines, uh, administrators are really, really important in shifting uh, the thought process in schools. Uh, right now in the world of reading, we're shifting from a balanced literacy approach to a more scientifically aligned approach. And administrators, they need to have the knowledge to help that shift take place in their buildings. Um, they also are going to have to support the people, the key players in their buildings that uh, like their reading specialist, um, because the reading specialist role now is changing toward a instructional leader in the building, and they're the literacy leader in that building. So they have to work with their colleagues. Uh, they have to work with staff. They have to work with parents even um, as we shift toward uh, better reading practices for our students. How do you both feel that can be implemented day in and day out with the various, as we know, these leaders our building leaders, our division leaders, and there's various capacities and roles that they have. So how do you see this play in day in and day out where you're currently working? So I feel um, as if, if I could speak to that, I feel as if it is very important that leaders make that concerted effort. And what I see in the administration that I currently work with is a concerted effort to be in the um, situations that include that planning and those conversations. They have placed themselves in those settings, in those professional learning communities, in those staff committee meetings, in the places that that planning is occurring. They are making sure that they're a part of those conversations. They're not just speaking, they're listening and being an active part of that. So again, it's that collaboration piece that is so important to listen to all of the experts in the room. And, and I concur in the world of reading. Uh, just today, I'm, I'm actually at a school and um, in the room for planning is the administrator, uh, the assistant principal. Uh, we also have uh, the special education teacher, Dr. Maja, she's there. Um, we also have um, the ESL teacher, so everybody that is going to impact that student is actually in the room as we begin our planning for the coming weeks and preparation for the state test. So that sense of collaboration is really important because the administrator, um, just being there and having their presence there makes a huge difference. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think too, like you're saying, that really sets the stage then regardless of what the need is or 
what you're addressing, whether it's planning for the rest of the year, or as we know, spring is very much so planning for these upcoming assessments, whether it's special ed or reading. And so I really do think that sets the stage in a really um, solid foundation as a leader um, moving forward with the plan to really have a cohesive unit moving forward and everybody's vision focused on um, the needs of the students while still supporting um, their staff members. So um, excellent insight there. Um, the next question I wanted to address really focused on um, the K-12 special education and reading leaders themselves. So teachers that are within the classroom. So I um, wanted to ask the panelists, um, as um, K-12 special ed and reading specialist teachers, um, despite the lack of staff, um, an increase in new teachers coming in in these roles, um, the various curriculum changes that we're seeing, um, in addition to them just fulfilling their regular roles and responsibilities as leaders within these classrooms, what do you think can be done to really ensure that the learning needs of these students in the K-12 setting are met in the area of special ed and reading? I really feel like, again, and I'm going to go back to this consistently, um, collaboration and connection are key in making sure that all of those needs are met, all of those learners' needs are addressed. You're, the buildings are filled with experts in every field, and we need to hone in on that expertise and make sure that the leaders need to make sure that venues are given for those leaders in their field to be able to share their information with their colleagues. And in that way, we can ensure that every learner is having their needs met within the school. And I would say also in the, in the form of reading, we're moving more toward a data-driven uh, way of looking at our students. And so we're making decisions based on data. So any um, help that uh, reading specialists can get in how to interpret the data and then not only interpret it and analyze it, but also what are the next steps after I have this data? Um, I would also uh, say they need to collaborate because um, with special ed, we have a lot of students that are in special ed, but we have to have a mindset that they're all our students. So with that in mind, we're going to work with all of our colleagues to meet the needs of our students. And another thing, and I heard this today, uh, trust and relationships. Uh, it's really important that the reading specialist builds the trust of the community, school community that they serve and that they also build the relationships because that's key to the shifts that we're making right now um, in reading. Yeah, those are excellent points. And just to add a little bit further, um, everything that you have both mentioned really does tie into when there are remediation and there are plans that need to be in place, whether it's for reading or a student that would need to be identified for special education services, it takes that collaborative effort, not only from the individuals that are working with the student day in and day out, but it does take the administrator and it does really help to have that communication open and already going with the parents and the various units that are involved with coming to that team and coming to the table together to really ensure that again, the trust is there and the relationship is built to then really come together with all of the information that everybody has to bring to the table to truly um, meet and identify what you can do to um, service the child and whatever that might be, whether it's in the area of reading um, or special ed. And in addition to that too, um, I think that goes along with our classroom settings. I think they're more inclusive than ever before. And I think as you're saying that trust and that relationship, being in an inclusive setting or in a self-contained setting, or when a reading specialist would come into the classroom or pull some out for a small group, um, you are collaborating with various professionals. And I think setting that foundation again with those individuals that are working with the student and having that commonality and that insight to really meet the learner's needs and come together 
and get a full picture on how to build those puzzle pieces to address the learning and see these students soar is really, really super important. So it does a lot of times, you know, go back to those collaboration and communication, but yeah, you hit the nail on the head with their relationship and trust component as well from the teachers in the classroom to the parents that are involved and to the various professionals that are um, working with these students. So I love that. And, and it's such a, a true privilege to, um, as a professional educator, to have that opportunity to collaborate. And you can learn so much from other educators as well and kind of put some things in your tool belt moving forward um, as you collaborate with the individuals. So. Dr. Copeland, can I add just a, a logistical, sure. I think a logistical piece that is very important. It is very important that the leaders in a building make time in schedules, that they schedule time and give opportunity for the people in the building to be able to collaborate. Teachers are busy and their, their days are packed, but there needs to be, they need, leaders need to chunk out time in those schedules that provide the opportunities and the coverage right? Because you're going to need coverage for those classes while you meet during the school day. And that's important that those leaders put that at the top of their agendas to make that a, a, a time, a specific time. Thank you. All right. The third topic that I wanted to address in this webinar, um, because we are in the higher ed field, in addition to being out in the case walls, K-12 setting is to really just talk about what are some ways our higher education programs can have a positive impact in these critical needs areas. Um, as the, our particular programs, we have an initial licensure special ed program where we do have um, brand new teachers coming into the field or getting their master's in special ed. And we also have teachers that might have been in the field for a little bit have their professional license and now are seeking this add-on endorsement as a reading specialist. So um, what are some ways higher education programs can really have a positive impact on these critical needs areas as these teachers are getting trained through our programs and then going out into these classrooms day in and day out and impacting these students? We, uh, so as the internship coordinator here at Regent, I can speak to the fact that in higher education, we provide that mentor opportunity for those teachers to be able to give them support in the classroom and a team of people that are willing to come together to share their expertise and support them through their journey. And I think it's incumbent on higher education to provide that kind of, that kind of support for their local schools. Um, I believe that as Christian leaders, we are to be stewards of our resources. And I believe that one of those resources is our human resources and the expertise that we have. It needs to be shared with those around us in order to um, forward our message as Christian leaders. And, and I would add that um, it's really important that our course work that we are assigning our students uh, leads to application um, in the classroom. I think that's really, really important. Um, the journal articles that they read uh, in this in the world of reading right now, we have so much coming at us uh, with the science of reading. Uh, we need to make sure that all of these trends are grounded in, in research. So we have to do the, the work so that our students, when they go out into the field, that they understand uh, all of the areas that they need to uh, in reading and the application from a balanced approach to a scientific approach. I also think that that it's important that as, as our graduates go out, that we ask the districts that they're going to, how are they doing? Um, and find out what exactly maybe some of the gaps are, but also some of the strengths that our, our students have, because I truly, I, this is my second, I had a second degree through Regent, and uh, it says Christian leadership to change the world. And, and that's really what I see assess um, Christian leaders who are always striving for excellence in what we do, uh, not just to serve man, but our purpose is to serve God. 
Yeah. The, and the impact in so many different ways um, coming from the completion of an educator preparation program is great to begin with. But then when the Christian leadership component is involved, it it really is truly impactful. I did want to go back to two things that each of you said. First, Dr. Maga, I wanted to kind of take a deeper dive regarding um, we have mentors through our program um, for our students that complete our licensure program. But I wanted to kind of talk with you a little bit and maybe Dr. Landry, you could have some input as well. Um, a lot of teachers that have left the school divisions were those experts or were the lead teachers in those areas. And so for somebody that is a mentor to one of our program completers who's you know, doing the coursework right now and learning the ins and outs of being a K-12 teacher, whether it's in reading or with SPED, um, what are some critical aspects that you would encourage a mentor to dive into as far as mentoring somebody who's new to this field and this critical needs area, whether it's SPED or reading? Well, I think first and foremost, there has to be constant contact. And I think it's very important that the communication is constant and it is something that um, there's an open line of communication between the mentor and the mentee and that they not only are being given um, advice, if you would, from the mentor, but they also know that they can lean on that person for support. We all know that education can be difficult. It's a difficult field sometimes. And we all need that support no matter how many years we've been in it. So I think that's important. Your presence as a mentor is important, whether it is via Zoom, as some of our um, students are in other states, but it's very important they see our face and they know that we can be reached and that we're here to encourage them, but also that we stay on top of the current best practices. I think as mentors, it's very important that we ourselves stay educated in best practices where we may not be in the classroom right now, but I think that it is incumbent upon us to stay in that research, that cutting edge research, and to know what the current best practices are. And, and I agree. Um, I was just having a conversation with an instructional coach today about the importance of coaching. And sort of like we do with our students, uh, a model of I do, we do, you do, and how that's going to be used um, as we implement so many changes in reading, especially in the state of Virginia. Uh, we need to partner together with a coach to uh, implement those practices that we want to see. We can't just rely on giving you the knowledge. We have to be there with you every step of the way to show you how to do what we would like for you to do. Because, you know, when it comes down to it, as the instructional coach was telling me, we all impact students and we want to make sure that they're impacted in the right way. Yeah, I think that goes along to just as um, accredited universities and um, programs that are really ensuring that our students are ready to go out and impact these fields. There is there is an amount of accountability that really is required for higher ed programs to really ensure that we do have positive program outcomes and that we do really seek the input um, from our stakeholders, which include those um, where our students are currently employed, in addition to where our internship students are, in addition to collaborating with other universities to really get the data that we need to see where the positive program outcomes are, in addition to where we can continue to ensure we're implementing those best practices um, within our content area that we embed in the classes and um, just ensuring a well-rounded experience, not only in the content and pedagogical knowledge, but also now let's apply it, you know, during the internship phase through the licensure program. So I love all those points that you make. And I think it's so crucially applicable. Each particular component within a higher ed program really impacts the overall outcomes for our students. And so the points that you made were just excellent. Um, the last question that I have, as we have just a few more minutes left in our discussion today, 
really focuses on the calling that many educators really feel they have to be in this field. Um, as Christian educators, you know, most of us feel that God has called us into this field. And so um, regardless whether our student um, has a faith walk or not, I wanted to just find out from both of you experts, how can an educator ful really fulfill the calling that they feel that they have on their life to be a special ed or a reading teacher? And what would be one word of wisdom or encouragement that you would give them for somebody that's a brand new teacher or somebody that's been out in the field right now and it is just a difficult time for them in the area of teaching in special ed or reading? So the quote comes to mind, Rachel, um, Dr. Copeland, that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And I truly believe that we, the people that are called into this profession by God, he's going to give us what we need, right? And it's an act of obedience. And I'm to take one step at a time in obedience and to keep my eyes focused on him. And when it gets tough, as we know it does, um, to remember that we are to persevere in that and that he will provide for us what we need to be able to provide all of our learners what they need to be successful. And I would continue that thought to say a scripture that comes to mind for me is Psalms 4610. It says to be still and know that I am God. And I think there's so many challenges right now in education, but um, for teachers and, and people that are of faith to just make sure each day they take the time for prayer, uh, for reading the word, uh, for immersing themselves in praise music, because we have to make sure that our cup is filled um, as we go out and walk in the calling that God has on our lives. Um, this year, I went to a student's room or, or a person's room. She's actually a student in Bregen. I didn't know that when I went there. Um, and we were just talking about her class and some of the challenges. But, you know, she told me, she said, I am called to do this. And I was just so taken back because we didn't know each other when I walked in there. But for her to understand the challenges that she was encountering, that she was going to stay the course because she was called. I love it. And how neat. You didn't even know you had I didn't know a that. student and you were mentoring them through and through. So that's amazing. If I could just add um, a word of encouragement or a little bit of wisdom. Um, I think as educators, regardless if it's in the K-12 setting or an administrator or being within um, higher ed programs, there's always opportunities to learn. And within each day, there are gonna be opportunities where learning might be difficult through that situation but do everything that you can to learn from the experience because that's where you can really grow. And then just to take it a step further, really utilize the individuals that are around you. Um, you know, it's such a blessing to be surrounded by other experts, whether again, you're within the school setting or with whether you're in um, higher education. And so I would just encourage any special education teachers or reading teachers listening to just really remember you're not alone in this and to really um, kind of soak up and collaborate um, expertise of those around you because that's again, where you can truly learn and grow professionally. And, and again, it all goes back to these K-12 students and when our hearts are in it and our focus is on these students, these critical needs areas are definitely critical, but the greater impact that we can have in these areas, despite the things that change, is really just an awesome opportunity. So I thank you so much to our panelists, Dr. Magi and Dr. Landry, and those of you that were able to join in this conversation today. I look forward to um, continuing to um, work with you both. And I just um, thank you again for the opportunity um, to have this discussion. And I look forward to how we're going to continue to impact the field 
day in and day out for um, God's glory. So thank you all for joining. Have a wonderful rest of your day and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.